Thank you very much. Uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Indian College of Allergy, Dr. Nagender Prasad, and uh, all the members uh, uh, of the organizing committee. I think it's a very, very important meeting which is being held. And uh, I am really thankful to you for giving me this opportunity to chair an important oh, session. As you all know, we are going to talk about uh, uh, the treatment of sleep apnea yes. and particularly with the non-CPAP uh, uh, modalities. Now, we, we all know that uh, CPAP is the first line of treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. But we also know that there are a lot of compliance issues uh, with CPAP. Uh, with all the uh, studies available, uh, uh, so far, uh, I can say that roughly about 50% of the patients who are advised CPAP therapy ultimately do not comply with CPAP therapy on the long run. So once you have a situation like this, where the gold standard treatment, what we call, I don't know whether we should call it gold standard or not, when it is effective only in 50 to 60% of the cases, when the gold standard therapy is not either effective or probably not uh, tolerable by the patient on long-term basis to give benefit in terms of preventing its uh, uh, long-term complications, then we have to look for alternative therapies. And uh, today's topic, I think, uh, is a realization to that, that we should uh, look for effective alternatives, uh, which can either uh, be given along with CPAP to make CPAP more easily uh, acceptable or independently, uh, which, which will uh, resolve this uh, chronic disease, which is associated with a lot of long-term complications. So I think to discuss this topic, uh, we have a very senior chess physician, uh, Dr. Rakesh Chavla, who I think in uh, Delhi circles, uh, Delhi and CR, I, and now in fact all over India, uh, most of the people know him. He does not require uh, any introduction, but uh, since I am in the chairman position, I have to introduce him formally. Dr. Chawla has been uh, very actively working in the field of pulmonology, critical care, and sleep medicine for the last, uh, I think, three decades now. Uh, he is at present uh, working as a senior consultant in three hospitals. You know, that is in Jaipur Golden Hospital, Saroj Super Speciality Hospital, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi uh, Cancer uh, Institute. So these are the three hospitals where he has been going, but uh, he has been very actively working in area of allergy, interventional pulmonology. I think he, he is very famous for a glue, glue therapy. I think he is amongst the first ones who introduced glue therapy and he has done a lot of work and I think published a few papers about this. Too. So he is also known as a glue man. Uh, many people say the glue man from Delhi. So he is he has popularized this form of therapy and um, uh, he has done a lot of work in this area. He has also been uh, active in other areas like um, pulmonology, uh, sleep medicine. He has been regularly organizing a meeting in Delhi uh, uh, every year, uh, a, a conference. And, uh, and uh, he has received uh, the various awards, orations, uh, and other recognitions. Uh, uh, I will uh, not, uh, you know, spend more time on that because most of the people know about him. So I'll request him to uh, uh, discuss about the non-CPAP therapies and uh, uh, particularly specifying uh, which are these uh, patients, you know, and uh, who, who may be more suitable for uh, uh, these kinds of non-CPAP therapies because uh, obstructive sleep apnea is a very common disease 
uh, afflicting about 5 to 10 percent of the population because as you grow older i think the, this prevalence increases so it's it's a very very important disease to recognize and treat so over to dr chavla for uh, your uh, lecture for the today's topic thank you professor suri i i whenever i invite him he is a legend in respiratory medicine people know him we followed him he is the original pioneer of sleep medicine in the country to introduced he he was i must say the first one who started doing sleep studies and getting sleep popularized in the country he is amitabh bachchan in respiratory medicine to popularize and bringing respiratory medicine and the interventional pulmonology to this level what the youngsters are enjoying today nobody can forget the contribution of professor suri thank you very much for chairing today the session i am obliged i am very thankful as rightly said 50% patients those who are diagnosed of obstructive sleep apnea are told discussed about the cpap therapy they are submitted for polysomnography and titration they are advised the cpap still they don't follow the cpap or they don't comply and at end of the day 25 to 30% people remain who continue using cpap still cpap remains the gold standard of obstructive sleep apnea there is no dispute about it those who use it really enjoy it when i came to delhi in 1996 i went to colin sullivan in sydney and got training and following the footsteps of professor suri who was practicing since 88 89 and uh, had a sleep disorder association of india and i privileged to became its member and i started practicing since then 1996 about sleep so i uh, i will now share my screen i hope it is available visible sir yes visible sir yes visible yes, Okay. Yes. Okay. Order the order the projection more please. The platform. I'm thankful to Ikai for inviting me to do the justice to non CPAP therapies. Why sleep apnea is not going away? We are big promoters of the junk food, and because this is tempting, and you are not able to hold on, and if it is served, you will definitely like to take a bite of it. we know the typical picture of obstructive sleep apnea how the snoring is happening how the flutter sound of snoring and suddenly this stops literally it stops and patient goes in apnea and there is a jerk of breathing and patient gets up and this episodes repeatedly happening in sleep you are able to see the malampatti score whether this patient has a severe obstructive sleep apnea or a mild sleep apnea or he is more or less normal or has got a mild sleep apnea by the oral examination we know what is an apnea it's a cessation of air flow more than 10 seconds and hypoapnea where the air flow is reduced more than 30% from baseline lasting more than 10 seconds associated with 4% of oxygen desaturation other terminologies which we use in sleep the primary snoring where rdi is less than 5 and there is again a debate whether this snoring which is disturbing to the partner or to the social system slides need the treatment moving. if it is not associated dr dr chavla your slides are not moving slides are not moving sir no okay again, and you I please go uh, please uh, stop share i again oh, share you again share and then uh, go to the uh, projection mode yeah projection mode i go here i i share now it is there go to the projection mode please projection mode is where sir on the bottom you get a yeah. screen yes 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 just yeah yeah correct where this no. one ah uh, yeah yes sir yes yes slide show yeah slide show okay now no 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 we have not we got to gone to the full moving, screen moving sir no no we are not going to full screen acha not going to full screen yeah go to the full screen yeah this, this was full screen yeah. which i switched 
but i think we are still not go to the go to the top line there is a slide show slide show slide show before review before here here on the top line yeah no beyond this he says review. i i i next, I, next to the review next to the review on the top line yeah 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 where, the where cursor and the view, same line yeah yeah where you see view review slide show animation so that slide show click there i'm not seeing it from the top bar it is next okay. to that so, okay i i'll just minimize and go back again i log out and log in correct okay you have logged out you just log in again okay share screen Where is he? Dr. Rakesh? Dr. Chawla? Oh, he is logged out. He's, you told that he will log out and then log, log in again. Okay, that's fine. respected chairman you can just be continue with the discussion just on the general aspect of the sleep disorders before he logged in yeah okay so uh, we we all know that uh, sleep apnea is one of the most uh, common sleep disorders uh, we uh, if you look into the overall uh, scenario of sleep disorders then insomnia probably would be the most common and in fact there has been a debate uh, 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 which is the next most common whether it is the restless leg syndrome or the sleep disorder breathing but most of the time we have seen that uh, these sleep disorders are uh, uh, comorbid with each other they are uh, seen together and it's it's very very important to uh, to evaluate these patients properly and uh, today Uh, as uh, dr uh, chavla is uh, uh, discussing a, a very important aspect of the management of uh, uh, of sleep sleep disorders uh, yeah i think uh, you have got it now you have joined you please go to the full screen slide mode yes it's changing now now it's changing but go to the yeah full screen yes yes click here isko minimize kar do yahan pe really you can continue i think you can continue the yeah. slides are visible you can go yes. ahead you can Dr. go ahead. chawla you can continue dr chawla can you hear us Unmute yourself. I think he may be mute. Rakesh, you had to unmute. You are muted. You have to unmute now. Yeah. Right. You are able yes. to see the changing yes. of slides. Yes. No? Yes. Yes. Okay. No, 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 changing is there. Projection mode is not there. Now, even the okay. noise is visible. You can go ahead. Okay. <coughs> go to the second Good. slide. Okay. This is this was the this was the first. This is the yeah. second. Okay. No, no, no. no second is no, not no. moving. Earlier it was moving. You uh, go to the second frame and click it. Bring the cursor on the second frame. Okay. Left side minimized one. You can close it. Okay. Now working. No. Not yet. Still. Try Still. to click. Try to click on the second slide. Slide number two on your left side. Acha. 
See, see if it moves okay. like that. Now moving? No. No. Can somebody at the... Yes, Aditya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, is, it has got to the third. Go ahead, like this one only. Aditya third. has come. He'll be helping me. You failed? Now full slide come here. Go to the, 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 you know, enlarge this. Go and go to the minima, minimize. Go to the other one. Yes, this one. Yeah. Click the here. Yes. Yeah. Now working, sir? Yes, sir. You are in the third slide. You okay. can go back to the second. No. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Tick. Go ahead, sir. Now working? Yeah, yes, yeah. Sir. Okay. Okay. So we, we know the types of sleep disordered breathing, apnea, hypoapnea. There are other terms which we use is a primary snoring, upper airway resistance mm -hmm. syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, very common for a pulmonologist to feel and experience. This is the graphic presentation, how we see the hypnogram for obstructive sleep apnea, central apnea, mixed apnea, mm -hmm and respiratory effort related arousals. Very important term, a sequence of breaths characterized by increasing respiratory efforts leading to Again, an arousal Chavla, sleep, it's not moving. which does not meet criteria for an apnea or hypoapnea. These okay. events must fulfill- Dr. Both. Chavla, sorry to interrupt you. Your slides are not moving. Still not moving? Now go to the third slide. Go to the slide and click there. Aditya. Now working, sir? No, still on the second slide only. Okay. Now just see this, see in this, it is working? Yes, now. No, it is working. Yeah. Working, okay, let me go in this mode. Yes. Okay. So, very oh, you important. already gone to the ninth slide. Uh, this is the ninth slide, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. 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 Let him go away. Okay, okay. I can go like this. Okay. Okay, sir. right. So, the RERAS is a very, very important it's a pattern of progressively more negative esophageal pressure terminated by a sudden change in pressure to a less negative level and an arousal. So this is not an apnea, but it definitely disturbs your speak, sleep and event lasts 10 seconds or longer. If you have more than five RERAS without desaturation, you should not miss it. It is upper airway resistance syndrome. We know pathophysiology of sleep apnea. The patient goes into sleep, loss of neuromuscular compensation, decreased pharyngeal muscle activity, airway collapses, apnea happens. Literally what you have seen in the video, it happens. Leads to hypoxia, hypercapnia, increased ventilatory efforts, arousal from sleep, pharyngeal muscles activity is restored, airway open and patient hyperventilate and again goes to sleep and again the same cycle. Hundred of times this thing happens and you, you get a sleep which is totally disturbed. What is a misnomer? The people who snore are the very good and the quality sleepers know it is a myth and a misnomer. Consequences of excessive daytime sleepiness, which happens because of obstructive sleep apnea, patient has increased motor vehicle crashes, increased work-related accidents, poor job performance, depression, family discord, decreased quality of life. And let me tell you, still after working 30 years in sleep, repeatedly talking, me and all those sleep practicing physicians, that government of India should not issue the driving license or the pilot license or the rail moving license without getting a patient for a polysomnography. Various cardiovascular consequences like systemic hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, cardiovascular diseases, cerebrovascular disease. Today, it is well established that the, these are the consequences of obstructive sleep apnea. We know the treatment is a gold standard for OSA is CPAP. There is no dispute. Now, today's topic is if CPAP, which is a magic box. Yes, it is a magic box. And if you believe it, 
it, it, it works like anything. Those who start enjoying the CPAP know the value of it. And what is the answer if it fails or people are not accepting it? So what are the various non-CPAP therapies? There's a beautiful review article as presented as a guidelines in 2021 by which were 2011 and now published in 2021 by European Respiratory Society on non-CPAP therapies for obstructive sleep apnea. And there is a mention of non-CPAP therapy in our guidelines, which are INOSA, made by Professor Suri, a mention about the non-CPAP therapies. They talk about laparoscopic RYGB surgery, custom-made dual block mandibular advancement devices, hypoglossal nerve stimulation, myofunctional therapy, maxillomandibular osteotomy, carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, positional therapies. But their discussion is primarily, and what is becoming more popular is the maxillary mandibular advancement therapies. So what are these non-surgical options and surgical options? So non-surgical management, the, the, the we know the PAP is the accepted gold standard therapy. We have alternatives like surgery, dental appliances, drug therapies, tracheostomy, or pacing like the hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Behavioral modification is a very, very important part of the non-CPAP therapies that the weight reduction, exercise, and changing your lifestyle, doing a modification in your lifestyle is, is very, very important. Smoking and alcohol is a big no. In behavioral, as I said, weight loss, abstain from alcohol and sedative, positional sleeping, smoking cessation, strengthening the dilator muscles. There is an instrument in, 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 in Australia continent, which is did -gari do, which, which helps when you start playing it. It helps reduce daytime sleepiness, reduces the snoring in people with moderate OSA, improves the quality of sleep and worthwhile trying for mild or positional sleep apnea. There's another device which is Provent Sleep Apnea. These all have got a very low evidence of uh, quality, but they are mentioned in the literature. This is the one way well you place it on the nostrils. When you are breathing in, it is all right. When you are breathing out, it gives the resistance and tries to open the, the, the airways. It decreases apnea, reduces daytime sleepiness, improves quality of sleep and reduces snoring. Proven sleep apnea therapy is disposable, nightly used nasal device placed just inside the nostrils and held securely in place with hypoallergenic adhesives. It, 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 it works as a positive air pressure. Back is generated when you are trying to exhale. It is FDA cleared, clinically proven, and is helpful in mild to moderate severe sleep apnea. It's ideal for travel, but it is contraindicated in patients with severe respiratory disorders including respiratory muscle weakness, bullous lung disease, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, or severe heart disease, and pathologically low blood pressure. Patient who experience an allergy to this device should not use it. Patient who develop nasal sinus or ear infection or inflammation should discontinue use of provent nasal device. It should not be used more than one of the sleep cycles. So per night, you have to use it once only. Patients should be instructed to breathe through their mouth while falling asleep. The safety and effectiveness of proven therapy in pregnant women, children under the age of 18 has not been established. As I said, patient may be allergic or patient may develop headaches or difficulty falling asleep, vertigo and anxiety, so they will not choose. We are mentioning about the tennis ball therapy which we tell our poor patients, if they have a sleep apnea, clinically you are able to diagnose. You tell them to buy 10 rupees ball and put it in their back of the pajama so that they will not be able to sleep straight. And this is a kind of a positional therapy. Now it has come as an electronic tennis ball. What it is, it, is, it, is, it helps you to get a best sleep. Sleeping on your back is more likely to obstruct your airways. It generates vibrations. So you, during the sleep, you sense, and with the period of time, you start sensing the minor vibrations. You change your position, the vibrations stop. 
This is how it looks like, and it comes as a night shift sleep position. Another part for the position therapy, the strap has got the magnetic attachment, and you are able to use it in the night, and you go to the position where you have a minimum snoring. So as I told you, it, it's an innovative device when worn around the neck during sleep, monitors the sleeping positions and then vibrates with increasing intensity until the wearer shifts. So it waits 15 minutes before beginning its tracking, giving you time to fall asleep naturally in whatever position you find comfortable. So the adjustable neck strap is made of silicone, so it is soft, non-abrasive against your skin, and it has got the magnetic attachment so that it should not strangulate. This is how it looks like. These are the magnetic attachments, and this is a night shift device, which has got a USB port. You can download the data. You can charge it, and during sleep, you can wear it. If you suffer from mild to moderate sleep apnea, the night shift is a simple solution to what seems like an overwhelming problem. This is how the reading comes when you down download the data and you can have the night shift report and you have used and if it is in the range of more than five hours, so this will give you a good reading and you can download the data and see about it. Another is becoming popular is a soft silicon nasal device. This is a device which you can put it in your nostrils. It may take three days a week to adopt using the device. It is easy to use. <clears throat> Clean it daily after use with mild soapy and, and what solution and let it dry and use it. Oral appliances, very popular, not available. These things are yet we need to practice, but they are available across sector three. The, the electronic tennis ball and proven devices, they are available in the country. We still have to have a dentist who are super specializing in sleep and trying to only figure out in sleep and making these appliances. I heard someone in RR hospital was taking interest and in making, but I have no experience. Maybe as effective as surgical option, however, low compliance rate of about 60%, and Walker opined it as a, as a worse form of treatment modality or the surgical, because if you use CPAP, it, it is different. How does an oral device work? OSA caused by loss of airway space. Most oral devices will advance the mandible. This pulls the genioglosses forward, which pulls the tongue forward, and upper airway space is regained. Snoring is diminished or eliminated, and, and it keeps simply the tongue out, same like the tongue retainer devices, which doesn't allow tongue to fall back and <laughs> the posterior pharyngeal space. These oral appliances, mandibular advancement appliances and tongue retaining devices are the non-surgical mode. Another is a Snorax, is a mouth guard and gently holds the tongue forward during sleep, keeps the upper airway open and free from <laughs> The mandibular repositioning, repositioning devices are mandibular positioning, anterior mandibular positioner, mandibular advancement prosthesis, mandibular repositioning prosthesis, adjustable mandibular positioner, mandibular repositioning appliance, mandibular advancement appliance. These are all mandibular advancement devices which helps mandible to be advanced and increasing the posterior pharyngeal space and reduces the snoring and sleep apnea. This is very popular in Europe and people are practicing it with very good results. It is indicated in retrogenthic patients, mild to moderate OSA, patients who are medically compromised, poor surgical risk, patients who fail or refuse the treatment as a diagnostic tool prior to the mandibular advancement surgery, you can use it. Snore guard, another equipment, the position in the mandible, three millimeter behind maximal protrusion opens the jaw by seven millimeter. It's easy to fit, covers the anterior teeth only and is soft and comfortable. Studies have shown improvement in snoring and OSA syndrome in most of the patients. These are the various mandibular advancement devices available which people are being suggested and used. These are the various tongue retaining devices 
they will hold the tongue it will not fall back during sleep and the posterior pharyngeal airway space remains open cost is approximately for the fixed devices 100 to 500 us dollars and adjustable devices is 300 to 800 us dollars and treating osa since in our country another thing the efforts which are going on or have been repeatedly said to cover it under the 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 tpa which is still not and the hospital stop hospital doesn't agree to do it on credit basis because companies will cut the money so another hindrance in popularizing poly somnography and the sleep work this is the biggest hindrance that you are not able to practice patients are not ready to pay cash to to get the sleep disorder study that poly somnography done so this is another field where we need to work and make government agree if you see cost of it abroad is approximately 3000 us dollars patients from usa are coming and getting the sleep studies done here i have a numerate number of patients for us they are coming to meet their family they know they have police they have sleep apnea they have been suggested they will get it done here get the form signed there and that form is acceptable abroad to buy the cpap the auto cpap or bipap whatever it is whatever then there are surgical options hypoglossal nerve stimulation in obstructive sleep apnea is a very very encouraging field people have started more and more practicing it so upper airway stimulation with the hypoglossal nerve improved upper airway potency by stimulation of the genioglossal muscle resulting in protrusion of the tongue several companies have developed hgns device this device has neuro stimulator this is implanted under the skin like a pacemaker a stimulation electrode placed on the hypoglossal nerve sensing lead that is placed between the internal and external intercostal muscles to detect the ventilatory efforts the device is activated prior to bedtime and deactivated in the morning after awakening this is how it looks like this is like a pacemaker under the skin and here you are putting it Uh, attachment to the hypoglossal nerve under cautious sedation surgery this is how the gloss hypoglossal the genioglossal muscle is exposed and electrode is being placed and you switch it on in the night so when the snoring and sleep apnea is happening it gets stimulated it improves obstructive sleep apnea there is a study in 12 months outcome by eric j jerian there was a significant improvement from baseline to 12 months in apnea hypoapnea index when you are using the hypoglossal nerve stimulator in the night except for maxillo mandibular advancement surgery every specific surgical technique targets the specific pharyngeal levels the site of a pervaire obstruction can be assessed by drug induced sleep endoscopy it is it is another advancement than <clears throat> in the daytime you can do a nasal endoscopy you can use your bronchoscope you can give the drug to the patient and induce the sleep and you can see during that sleep period which is the area which is getting more obstructed so that you can address the surgical procedure to correct that area surgical indications are the indications how we define obstructive sleep apnea moderate or severe the only thing is the patient is not ready to accept cpap and he is medically stable for surgery which procedure should be done there are three major regions of obstruction as i told you nasal cavity retropalatal or retrolingual so the nasal cavity or the oropharynx or the hypopharynx so you have to design and do the cephalometric analysis to find out the area which needs to be corrected so you have super specialized ent surgeons who are into uvulo palato pharyngeoplasty and doing these surgeries various procedures the surgical procedures are the maxillo mandibular advancement rhinological procedures palatal reduction radio frequency procedures tongue based suspensions genioglossus advancements hyoid suspension caup 
filler procedures, tonsillectomies, adenoidectomies, tracheotomy. So I'll just give you a glimpse of this. We have experienced in our patients the uvulopalato pharyngeoplasty, what the patients have gone through. And there is a time when this procedure fails. Again, the answer is CPAP. Now it becomes difficult for a patient to accept the CPAP because posterior resistance is totally, totally gone. The uvula is gone and, and the part of the soft palate is gone. So this is another difficulty. Once this surgery fails, then what is the answer? How this maxillary mandibular advancement operation is done, I will like you to enjoy at least the videos and have an idea what I am talking about. For severe disease, failure with more conservative measures, mid-phase palate and mandible advancement anteriorly and increases the space posterior. See this how it works. So this is the posterior pharyngeal space which is open. This is an ideal airway that is the constricted. Once the surgery is done, how it is performed as multiple levels and you will see how the space will increase. The osteotomies are done. The plates are fixed. Now you see the airway which is constricted by doing that surgery, this will become ideal and, and you are able to see the advancement of this surgery. Various rhenological procedures, they again increase, nasal resistance may increase, negative pressure of the airway during inspiration, septoplasty, turbinate reduction, and DNS correction, how it works. This is how you do the endoscopic septoplasty, what we call it as a DNS repair to increase the nasal cavity and the nasal space to help patient breathe easy and sleep apnea because it is a prerequisite to have the thyroid functions done and ENT examination, if there is a local obstruction, then you have to go through the ENT procedure. This is how the tonsillectomy is done. These are the beautiful videos. If you permit me, I, I go to... Uh, the, the beautiful videos I am sure you will enjoy. Video is not operating. Uh, I, 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 I will stop share the previous uh, one and, and uh, I'll share this yeah, new yeah. one. Okay. I will, I, I'm going to share this uh, one. Uh, one. Uh, I, uh, one. Give me one minute, sir. Sure, sure. Let me share the, the new one. I don't know. These are the beautiful videos. Anyhow, now screen is visible. Yeah, it's visible. Uh, what has happened today? I think you can leave it, uh, Dr. Okay. 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 Because, okay. Uh, you can have an idea. Of the time. Okay. Fair enough, sir. Fair enough. So you you can have the tonsillectomy. You can have adenoidectomy. Uvulopalatal pharyngeoplasty, it was introduced by Fujila in 1981 
and there's a same time when CPAP was available to the country with the first paper published in Lancet and by Colin Sullivan regarding the CPAP. So you have adenoidectomy and, and the success rate of uloplatopharyngeoplasty increases with dice, the drug induced sleep endoscopy, as I've told you, it has to be performed before deciding for surgery. What is this drug induced sleep endoscopy? As I've told you, by doing under sedation, you can do a bronchoscopy or with the, with the nasal fiber optic scope, you can see the level of the surgery to be done. This is how the, the UPAP is done. You take off the sleeve of the soft pellet and uvula. You can do it laser assisted uvula pellet of pharyngeoplasty. Another beautiful video if it works, not working, I don't know. Anyhow, you could have a fair idea how laser assisted uvula pellet of pharyngeoplasty is done. This is another procedure which is lateral, lateral pharyngeoplasty. Then there are tongue-based suspension devices and, and these suspension devices are placed in tongue and, and the tongue is that, that suspension device will induce fibrosis and the tongue is brought forward. Again, another beautiful video, let me see if it works. No. So th this is basically the tongue reduction devices, radio frequency ablation, is inserted into the various parts of the palate, tonsils and tongue based at various terminal thermal energies, again to induce the fibrosis and retracting the tongue forward so that the posterior pharyngeal space increases. This is how the radio frequency ablation of snoring and mild sleep apnea by the radio frequency probes are done. Placement of implants in the soft palate at two millimeter apart are done to again retract it and increase the retropharyngeal space. So this is how the, the pillar procedures for snoring are done. Implants a beautiful video again. So how it works, again, it's not working. I, I am sorry for all this, it's a beautiful videos. Genioglossus advancements, hyoid suspension, tracheotomy indicated for presence of severe life-threatening OSA not acceptable. I have not seen yet patient where tracheotomy is done for obstructive sleep apnea. Another field which is important is the bariatric surgery for obstructive sleep apnea. The BMI is calculated as weight and height in scare meters, lowest mortality, highest mortality with BMI more than 40. BMI more than 40, approximately 100 pounds over the ideal weight. The patients who are advised the surgery for sleep apnea to treat when they are morbidly obese. The medical complications of obesity, we understand the pulmonary disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, gallbladder disease, gynecological abnormalities, osteoarthritis, skin, gout, phlebitis. So you, you have the comorbid conditions and complications of obesity and the obstructive sleep apnea. And if you treat obesity, I am sure so many problems are taken away. The various health risks of obesity I have already described. Indication of surgery is the comorbid condition and BMI is more than 40 kg per square meter. Indication for surgery age more than 18 or less than 60. Patient is not able to manage with diet. Patient is not able to manage with the good exercise. There is no endocrinological disease and patient is psychologically sound. Goals of surgery is minimum 50% of excess weight to be lost and it should be well tolerated. Various surgical procedures are restrictive procedures like gastric bending, vertical bending, gastroplasty, vertical gastrectomy, malabsorptive procedures like biliopancreatic diversions or hybrid procedures, the row and y gastric bypass, which is very popular with the geriatric surgeons, bariatric surgeons. This is how the gastric binding is done with the filled band or with the unfilled band. So that to reduce the, 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 the gastric uh, space or the appetite should go down. Vertical banding gastroplasty, reducing the space of the stomach. Vertical gastrectomy, you can 
seven eight, uh, seven by eight part of the stomach is reduced so that the appetite will go down and and the food will stay for the minimum time in the stomach and goes to the 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 gi tract bilio pancreatic diversions <clears throat> rowan y where there is a direct anosmosis at the lower and upper end of the stomach with the intestines this is how rowan y gastric bypass is done and it is very effective for morbid obese patients complications are there like leak hemorrhage stomal stenosis marginal ulcers internal hernia you have to be very very careful you have to counsel the patient because patient is otherwise absolutely all right except he is morbidly obese he was snoring and sleep apnea he is not ready to accept the bipap or the cpap he has been advised surgery for the treatment if he gets into these any of these complications then then things are taken in a very bad spirit surgical anaemia management provides effective management of ssa can be safely performed in most of patients with proper pre operative preparations significant peri operative risk in some patients surgery should be considered for patients unable to utilize non surgical management chances of success with surgical management decrease with increasing friedman staging stage 1 and 2 patients have good success with uppb and tongue based procedures stage 3 and 4 have much lower rate of success following the uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty cpap is to conclude cpap is regarded as a treatment of choice for obstructive sleep apnea with moderate to severe ossas clinical success of cpap is however limited due to intolerance and less compliance efficacious alternative therapies include oral appliances and surgical procedures future use of high technology upper airway mod models based on ct scan cfd as clinical utility for the assessment of the treatment adding dice to diagnostic workup of osa success rate of both upper airway surgery and oral appliances therapy increases significantly and oral appliances therapy is getting very popular in the european countries sleep better feel better and increase your energy 150% by banishing your snoring problems this is the big reason patient doesn't want to be ganesh in or the wife doesn't want a ganesh in the bed so a factor of denial for using a cpap and we have to suggest the non cpap therapies but they have a very low quality of evidence as cpap is a gold standard big patients the big risk and big expectations thank you thank you dr chavla for a very nice presentation uh, you have uh, indeed uh, touched upon the various uh, uh, treatments uh, which are available uh, to the patients um, who who fail uh, the standard therapy or uh, or uh, those who refuse so there can be three categories where the cpap fails one Uh, there is an actual failure. This can be due to uh, side effects. This can be due to intolerance. This can be uh, due to uh, uh, certain complications. You know, we know that uh, sleep apnea is not a one disease. There are many phenotypes, and uh, there are patients who may require additional treatments with CPAP. for the treatment to be effective you know we know that uh, uh, sleep apnea patients have uh, issues of low arousal threshold there are some patients who have uh, very small anatomy then there are uh, patients with loop gain so there are different uh, issues you know there are patients with pharyngeal dilator muscle uh, contract uh, contraction issues so these are uh, problems which uh, should be looked into the, the 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 sleep apnea phenotyping needs to be done and uh, many patients who fail uh, cpap actually if you add uh, treatments like uh, uh, oxygen therapy or you may add some uh, dead space to increase their uh, co2 levels uh, so that you know Uh, their uh, carbon dioxide levels do not go below uh, the apnea threshold uh, 
then use of oxygen, use of sedative drugs to enhance uh, the arousal threshold, uh, to, to in fact uh, uh, make arousability uh, less easy. So, so I think these are uh, important things, you know, which should be tried. Surgery is another important thing to help uh, the patients with CPAP. Uh, that means uh, a patient who is intolerable to uh, CPAP could be due to nasal obstruction, a patient having deviated nasal septum, hypertrophic turbinates, patients with uh, uh, large adenoids, tonsils. So these patients, you know, if you if you do these what we call adjunctive uh, nasal surgeries, the CPAP compliance may improve. There are some patients who may require uh, very high pressures and there is pressure intolerance. So hybrid therapies like uh, adding a, uh, a dental device along with CPAP is another option. You know. So I think now uh, there are multiple uh, 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 treatments which one can use along with CPAP to make CPAP treatment more acceptable than what it used to be conventionally. Uh, but then, uh, you know, even with all these, uh, there are many uh, patients who may refuse and uh, uh, Dr. Chavla has uh, tried to uh, highlight various uh, other modalities of treatment. Amongst them, you know, dental devices uh, were, uh, uh, were mentioned. So I would say uh, dental devices are useful only for patients with mild to moderate disease. So we, we can't treat patients with severe disease, uh, particularly those who are having their apnea, hypopnea index of more than 30, 40, 50, because these treatments are uh, at best effective in reducing the severity of disease by 50%. So if, if the patient has a mild disease, then reducing 50% means you are actually making them normal. So, so mild to moderate disease is a, is, a, is a situation where you can consider dental devices. If you want to use uh, dental devices in a severe disease, then it has to be combined with either surgery or maybe um, with the CPAP. So you may use combined uh, treatment like that. So, so dental devices are very uh, important uh, treatment for, for such, such group that they may be more useful in uh, younger people, those who are not obese and uh, uh, those who are mild, having mild to moderate disease. Then, we, the next thing which Dr. Chavla discussed was surgery. I think there are many surgical options and uh, uh, it is very important uh, that these patients needs to be properly evaluated uh, to look for the site of obstruction so that you can plan their surgeries properly. And he also, also mentioned about drug-induced uh, sleep endoscopy. Now the question is, what is the role of this modality? Now we uh, have been evaluating our patients of sleep apnea with the uh, uh, static measures, you know, the, particularly during the daytime. You, you have been doing nasal endoscopy when patient is awake, or you can doing uh, anatomical assessment by kephalometry so that you could see whether the upper airway is narrow or not. We, we have also been using CT scans and uh, also the MRIs. The only problem with these investigations have been that uh, they were done when the patients were awake. And, and uh, the sleep apnea is a problem which uh, happens during sleep. And uh, during sleep, uh, the obstruction uh, can be dynamic. You know, it can start at one point, say, at a retropalatal region, but it, then it can progress and uh, involve the retrolingual region. So it's... it's it, there are, there are, in fact, a majority of the patients who have obstructions at multiple levels. So those uh, patients, you know, unless you evaluate them during sleep, at, uh, then it is very difficult. And the, and the most challenging thing is that you can't uh, do uh, various procedures when the patient is sleeping. You can't take a patient um, in the CT scan and make him sleep or an MRI. Though dynamic uh, MRI has been now done uh, in some cases, uh, it's a, it's a time-consuming pr procedure. You are giving patients sedatives to sleep. Uh, the the another you know the, when you give uh, so to overcome this problem, drug-induced sleep endoscopy has come so that 
you are trying to simulate conditions of sleep. What I am trying to say is that you are trying to simulate conditions of sleep, but you are not actually inducing sleep because this is uh, drug induced. It is not the natural sleep. So there are limitations here because if you oh, give the dose of drug, which may be more than required to induce sleep, because sleep, uh, you know, when you, when you anesthetize a patient, you give uh, the, the, the level of anesthesia increases with the increasing dose of the anesthetic you use. So uh, unless you are very, uh, you know, clear about the dose or the, the, your, your procedure is uh, protocolized, then uh, you may actually overdo in the drug and induce more obstruction. And that can give you false result about the level of obstruction. So these are, there are still uh, limitations of certain procedure. These procedures need to be standardized. And then, you know, if, 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 if you can see what are the procedures, uh, what are the levels of obstruction, then you can plan uh, uh, the proper surgeries. The another very important, uh, you know, contribution of drug-induced sleep endoscopy is that uh, we have recognized that uh, 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 epiglottis, epiglottis is a very important area, which we were not thinking previously, uh, contributing to sleep apnea and also CPAP failure, epiglottis collapse. That's one thing. And other thing is the lingual tonsils, which were recognized to be important factor with drug-induced endoscopy. So uh, when we are uh, considering surgery for patients of sleep apnea, the major problem has been the evaluation. And uh, what you actually understand or appreciate with these evaluations, the site of obstruction, and if you plan surgery accordingly and do the surgery and then do the post-operative evaluation, what we have been seeing that uh, the, the results have been not good. So if you if you do uvulopalatopharyngoplasty, the results have been 50%. If you combine uvulopalatopharyngoplasty with tongue-based surgeries, still the outcome is variable from 30% to 80 or 90%. So it all indicates that there is limitation the way we evaluate and drug-induced uh, sleep endoscopy has overcome many of these uh, indication, but this procedure still needs to be standardized for this thing. So, so that's uh, uh, about the surgery, which Dr. Chavla mentioned, and he has uh, talked about various procedures uh, very nicely. And uh, then, of course, there are some selected uh, glossopharyngeal nerve stimulation, which, uh, you know, uh, has been uh, considered for select group of patients. And these are the patients uh, which are selected by drug-induced uh, 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 endoscopy, where uh, the, you have to rule out the concentric uh, uh, obstruction of the pharynx. So that, that's, that's one, you know, where the, these kinds of treatment uh, may not be very uh, useful. And then, of course, uh, uh, the maxillomandibular surgeries, they are particularly useful for syndromic view, you know, particularly those who have uh, a severe degree of uh, 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 malformations, syndromic, what we call, uh, severe microgenetia or the craniofacial anomalies. These are the patients, you know, who may be most uh, suitable for um, uh, uh, maxillomandibular advancement procedures, you know, for this thing. So I think uh, we, uh, we had a good session. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, are there any yeah. questions? Uh, we'll take one or two questions. We'll be all right. Uh, sure, sure. sure. Uh, Participants can ask the questions if they have. Any questions? Okay, sir. We will conclude the session. One question, I said. Yeah. Please. Instead of what is the role of uh, uh, assessing the arousal threshold or uh, the loop gains, etc., uh, because uh, many of the non anatomical traits. As you know, we can divide the patients as then having anatomical traits and non-anatomical traits. Anatomical traits are definitely dealt with the different types of surgery, as you have mentioned. But again, uh, post-surgical failure may be due to having some overlapping non-anatomical traits like high loop gain or low arousal threshold like that. So how we can assess the what is the component of 
anatomical or non-anatomical pathophysiological problem in a particular patient in our clinical practice so that we can give the more precise treatment for the patient. <coughs> yeah. Uh... Dr. Chavla, would you like to... May I answer, Karo, sir? Please, okay. you answer, sir. Okay. 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 So, this is a very important question. And uh, we know that uh, sleep apnea is a heterogeneous disease. And uh, there are uh, clinical and uh, physiological phenotypes. So, uh, sleep apnea is not just an anatomical disease. That people who have small, anatomically small pharynx are likely to develop. That is, of course, one of the most important trait. So practically all uh, patients of sleep apnea will have anatomically small pharynx. So that, 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 that's one uh, important thing. Then, you know, there are other factors which will contribute to uh, development of upper airway obstruction. Now, these factors are low arousal threshold. Now, you may ask me this question, how can low arousal threshold lead to uh, upper airway obstruction. How, the other thing which you mentioned was, how can high loop gain lead to upper airway obstruction? So, so, so let me uh, combine these two together because they are interlinked. Now, what happens if a patient has a high loop gain? So what do we mean by high loop gain? High loop gain means when the ventilatory response to a ventilatory disturbance is out of proportion. So for a given change in the ventilation, there is a usually a given change in the response. So, so if a patient develops hypoventilation due to apnea or hypopnea, there is the increase in carbon dioxide level, there is decrease in oxygen. So to this ch change in the gas exchange, uh, there is an increase in ventilation uh, through the respiratory center. And this increase in the minute ventilation is such that it restores that disturbance. But in some patients, what happens that this response is exaggerated. With the result, patients tend to overventilate for a given ventilatory disturbance. With the result of this overventilation, the, the carbon dioxide level go below normal. And when they go below apneic threshold, so we know that there is a level of carbon dioxide or PCO2 below which we stop breathing. And that is called apneic threshold. And usually this apneic threshold is two to four millimeters below your uapneic PCO2. Suppose if uh, my uapneic means if you do my blood gas and if that PCO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury, then the apneic threshold will be something around 36, 37, something like that. So it's just close to that level. So if I tend to overventilate and then the PCO2 goes below that 36, 37, you will become, I'll become apneic. So that is, so patient becomes apneic means there is no respiratory output from the brain, from the respiratory center. And when there is no output, there is hypotonia of the upper as well as upper airway muscles as well as the respiratory muscles because uh, when we when you breathe when the respiratory stimulus to breathe goes it goes to the diaphragm and it also goes to the upper airway pharyngeal dilator muscles so that you know when when your diaphragm contracts and generate a negative pressure upper airway does not collapse so the upper airway pharyngeal dilator muscles also become active so that's you know in 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 tandem in combination you know we have so when the PCO2 level goes below apneic threshold, there is no respiratory output. There is no motor output. So when there is no motor output to pharyngeal dilator muscle, they become flabby. They become hypotonic and the upper airway collapse. So that's, that's a very, very important thing that when a patient has a high loop gain, and, and this you are going to recognize only once you put a patient on CPAP. So, so you were asking, how to recognize this thing. So if you, if you put a patient on CPAP treatment, suddenly the obstruction is relieved. Uh, that means the apneas and hypopneas have gone. There is a tendency to overventilate because this is a response, you know, because sleep apnea patients usually breathe 
in partial or complete obstruction during sleep. And they snore, that means this is a partial obstruction and they develop hypopnea and apnea, that means complete obstruction. So during, so, so they have, you know, that's the way they breathe. The, when, when you put a CPAP and suddenly remove this upper airway obstruction and there is a tendency to overventilate. And when you overventilate, then you tend to decrease your CO2 level below apneic obstruction. So, so when you put this patient on CPAP, uh, the breathing improves, the upper airway obstruction improves, the snoring disappears, but then uh, because of this overventilation, the CO2 level goes down, then starts developing central apnea. So this is what we call complex sleep apnea, or we call it treatment emergent central sleep apnea. So when they develop these central apneas, then uh, uh, you know you, you you tend to diagnose that this is a patient who have a tendency of high loop gain. So that you know once uh, uh, they they develop uh, obstruction uh, because of this then uh, 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 so so when you when you, where, where, uh, when you give cpap to this patient they they don't breathe because even though their upper airways passage is open but they will not breathe and their their oxygen will fall their co2 level will rise again and again you know this will lead to another loop gain response so this thing will continue throughout the night and will make the patient very uncomfortable and they will not uh, comply with the CPAP. So, so uh, and the another way, you know, uh, the patient tend to hyperventilate is frequent arousal. You know, what happens when the uh, patient hyperventilates? You, we know that our uh, response to a respiratory disturbance is different when we are awake and when we are sleeping. So our response to uh, a respiratory disturbance, that means to hypoxia or hypercapnia, is low when we are sleeping than when we are awake. So uh, when patients' arousal threshold is low and uh, they will just wake up with the, with the slightest disturbance, then their breathing control, respiratory control, will keep shifting from sleep to awake. And with the result, there is a uh, rapid change in the ventilatory response to disturbances. And that also makes breathing unstable. So both, uh, you know, the low arousal thresholds and loop gain can actually create central sleep disorder breathing, uh, uh, which makes CPAP treatment much less uh, tolerable for this patient. So, so to treat uh, these patients, you know, you have to identify uh, how, how you identify low arousal thresholds is these patients will tend to have shorter apneas. You know? So when you are looking into the uh, the diagnostic record of this patient, the apneic length is small. They will have 10 seconds to 15 seconds, very short apneas, and they wake up and their apneas are terminated. As against, you know, patients with the normal and the high threshold where you will, uh, they will tend to have apneas which are 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, and even some patients will have apnea lasting for one minute for this thing. So, so from this, you know, very, very, uh, frequent and short apneas with little desaturations because because the length of apnea is short so their their degree of desaturation is also less so that's how you recognize you know roughly the low arousal threshold you also recognize loop gains you know by uh, by central apnea so these are things you know which we treat we we treat um, uh, loop gain by giving oxygen or what we do is we add a dead space with a CPAP mask, so that patient tend to rebreathe uh, the expired air more, and their CO2 level goes up. So with the result, their uh, uh, their oxygen levels will not go below apneic threshold. So, so you can stabilize uh, their breathing. Uh, so putting, or you can. There are other methods. You can actually give some carbon dioxide to them. You know, there are uh, PAP gams, what we called, where uh, uh, you can add low low uh, concentration carbon dioxide. To increase CO2 levels for this thing, but I think the 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 important uh, things are giving oxygen because oxygen will reduce their loop gain. So giving oxygen, adding uh, a dead space, uh, uh, the, these two things are very important uh, modalities to take care of the loop gain. Third thing is uh, for lows or arousal threshold, you can use uh, drugs like uh, uh, zolpidem or some. Uh, uh, short-acting benzodiazepines. So these, 
they can um, increase their arousal threshold with the result uh, they won't have frequent arousals and uh, the frequent shifts in their uh, breathing control from wake to sleep and from sleep to wake, this can also be controlled. So these are, I think, uh, important things, you know, which needs to be uh, uh, looked into. And uh, I can tell you uh, these uh, traits are seen in 30 to 40% of uh, sleep apnea patients. So uh, when we are trying to do home studies and try to treat this patient with auto CPAP, we are likely to miss uh, these kinds of uh, problems. And uh, that's why, you know, any patients uh, who have been evaluated through home studies and put on auto CPAP and not responding and is not comfortable, it is always better to do a, a, a full night study and try to understand uh, uh, these uh, uh, traits, uh, phenotypic traits, and uh, try to give additional treatment along with CPAP. Because CPAP will remain the, the baseline, uh, the default treatment, and then you may have to add these, these things. Uh, so, Can I ask a question, sir? Yeah, sure. Uh, I am Shakuntala Lavasa from Chandigarh. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, whatever you told today, ninety uh, percent of things are absolutely, you know, knowledge new to me. That's why you know you should think that my questions are out of curiosity and not based on knowledge at all. So they may sound naive, but my question is this: that uh, right from the beginning, is there any methods? to distinguish that which patient will respond to CPAP, which patient will respond to non-CPAP, and which patient is definitely a candidate for surgery. So that is number one. Number two is that in yog, are there any documented techniques which can actually make you better and, you know, reverse uh, the sleep apnea kind of thing? So these are the questions which are coming to my mind. And thank you really so much for excellent lecture. And it's uh, right, uh, you know giving rise to so much curiosity and interest and thought provoking. So these are the questions. If you would answer, I will be grateful. About yoga also. See, you. uh, your questions are uh, again uh, very important. And uh, uh, most of the people think that uh, uh, we should look into uh, some forms of therapies, you know, uh, uh, non-CPAP. It is actually a part of non-CPAP therapies where we can treat uh, uh, sleep apnea with uh, some form of exercises or modulating the upper airway pharyngeal muscles. But here I would like to uh, mention to you that sleep apnea is not due to... Uh, any kind of muscle weakness. Our, mm -hmm. the, if you try to look into the muscle strength, I mean the pharyngeal muscle strength, they are, and the muscles, they are actually hypertrophic. They, they, they're strength wise, they, uh, they are always overacting, over, overactive. You know why they are overactive? Because what is the job of a pharyngeal dilator muscle? The pharyngeal dilator muscle is to open up the pharynx. Mm -hmm. And those people who have anatomically small pharynx, they have to overact to, to, to actually compensate for the anatomical deficiency. So if, if somebody has an anatomically small pharynx, then to keep the pharynx open, the pharyngeal dilator muscle must overact. And if you mm -hmm. actually measure the EMG of the pharyngeal dilator muscles of sleep apneic patient while awake, not during sleep, and normal people, uh, their baseline EMG levels are very high. So they are actually, the, the muscles are have a hypertonicity because they are trying to keep the upper airway open uh, when they are awake. Now, what happens during sleep? Now, sleep is a physiological state. And, in, and whatever happens in sleep apnea is physiological. There is nothing pathological happening in sleep. That's why you will never find a drug therapy effective drug therapy. So far, we have not found. Now, I'll, uh, I'll try to explain it to you a little more. You know, when you are uh, awake, you can sit, you can stand, you can walk. But can you sleep sitting? Can you sleep standing? You have to lie down. Because 
your postural muscle tonicity is lost in sleep so we lose our posture control in sleep it is physiological so we cannot stand and sleep we cannot sit and sleep we have to lie down so we that does not mean our our back muscles our postural muscles are weak and we cannot stand and sleep so similarly when you go to sleep there is a hypotonicity of pharyngeal dilator muscles which are overactive when they were awake so there is a loss it's a physiological loss of muscle tone and that actually results into upper airway obstruction because this muscle tone which was keeping the upper airway open when the patient was a person was awake actually this is lost in sleep and it is a physiological phenomenon there is nothing pathological but since the upper airway is anatomically small and when this person goes to sleep that upper that physiological loss of upper airway tonicity results into upper airway obstruction and this will open only when the person will wake up the moment the person wakes up this tonicity returns and the upper airway opens up the again he goes to sleep this tonicity is lost and again the upper airway closes and again he wakes up so this is the process which continues throughout the night so you can not you know uh, like i said if you want to stand and sleep you say i'll start doing my postural muscle exercises and then i will be able to sleep and stand and sleep similarly you know uh, by doing upper airway muscle any yoga or any exercise of the pharyngeal dilator muscle which are anyway overactive during wake period we may not be able to uh, treat although there are uh, certain uh, exercises have come which are trying to make them uh, 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 more active but the, these are in the experimental stage but to me uh, it will be a something very difficult you know because first of all you will have to demonstrate that there is a weakness of those muscles only mm. maybe in those select people uh, or where there is a poor pharyngeal dilator response to a disturbance uh, only then you know we can consider because you have to generate a hypothesis that yoga or a particular type of exercise which will involve the pharyngeal dilator muscles is going to correct sleep apnea the upper airway obstruction during sleep because which is which is a which is a physiological thing happening in sleep so that's that's why i, I would say that uh, uh, the 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 any kind of exercise leave aside yoga all forms of exercises uh, may not be uh, very effective in uh, treating sleep apnea though though there are exercises available people are trying to do it and uh, uh, it may it may improve it may be in some select group of cases which needs to be uh, studied that's one but there you had second question also so, so no harm so actually no harm actually is that so but they may harm also no no i don't see any harm they may no not harm. be good okay. no harm you one can do ha huh. they uh -huh. no harm but they should not give false assurance that you can be all right by this yeah. that is what i feel that anything should you know, be emphasized anything which we uh -huh. advocate should be verified uh, with pre and post uh, uh, sleep study that a particular thing has resulted into uh, resolution of the uh, disease thank you very much sir yeah uh, and then how to select sir how to select that who will respond only to surgery so that rather than wasting time on this that you can straight away go for surgery and uh, that is what also is important to my mind that why waste time when surgery is the definite answer yeah i i, I think or should you go for surgery only when other techniques fail no no this is not uh, correct uh, yeah yeah but what you do is when you do a sleep study and uh, uh, all uh, and the, the the purpose of doing a sleep study uh, is to one uh, make the diagnosis to confirm the diagnosis and second is to quantitate the severity of the disease so after the diagnosis when you quantitate the severity you you we normally do it on the basis of ehi uh, which of course is again a questionable thing you know people say that you should quantitate severity on number of other parameters like 
degree of oxygen desaturation, arousal index, and so many other parameters. But at present, we use apnea hypopnea index or respiratory distress index. And uh, if uh, uh, and, and we make them mild, moderate, and severe accordingly. Less than five is normal, five to 15 mild, 15 to 30 moderate, and more than 30 severe. So if you have a patient who falls into mild to moderate category, these are the patients who can be considered uh, for surgery. They are likely to respond to surgery, uh, uh, provided you do a proper evaluation. Because uh, most of the surgical procedures which have been done till recently have only resulted in 50% response. And there's a lot of variability. In some cases, you see 80% response. In some cases, 30%. Response. And the, the reason is that we have not evaluated our patient properly because what you thought is probably a palate problem. And you did uvula palate of ringoplasty. That patient also had a tongue problem, also, which was not done. So the, the knowingly knowing that what are the different points at which obstruction occurs. And unless you do all those surgery, uh, correct all those obstruction points by multiple level surgeries, you know, uh, the uvulopalatopharyngoplasty, tongue base, or maybe uh, at the epiglottis level. So unless uh, your evaluation is correct, the outcome of the surgery is not good. But you can consider this uh, only in, if you want surgery as a curative procedure, only in mild to moderate cases. But surgery in uh, mm -hmm. severe cases, you can only uh, do it to reduce the severity and then give CPAP or a dental device. The third thing is uh, you should do nasal surgeries uh, as an adjunctive therapies to make CPAP more easily acceptable. So that's why, because if somebody who has a nasal obstruction and you put a nasal mask, uh, is not going to tolerate that and it, there is going to be CPAP failure. So their correcting the nasal obstruction will result into better, uh, uh, you know, uh, CPAP acceptability, accept, better acceptance of uh, CPAP. So you have to yeah. actually make a diagnosis and basic evaluation of the upper airway anatomy mm -hmm. of the patient so that, you know, you can choose whether this patient is suitable for age of the patient, uh, obesity level. Or obese patient surgery probably will not do well. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very uh, much. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Samuel Sarkar from Ranchi. Uh, I've asked uh, about uh, uh, non anatomical traits uh, uh, just a few minutes ago. So uh, thank you very much. You have, uh, you have given a very uh, elusive explanation of everything. But I think, sir, uh, still we are following uh, AHI as the gold standard for diagnosis and severity grading. And we are treating with uh, uh, CPAP as the gold standard. As if one, uh, we know that one size fits all treatment will not allow the proper treatment of this uh, uh, complex phenomenon or OSA patient, as you have explained very well. So here comes the, I think here comes the importance of assessing the non-anatomical trait in each and every patient. And surgery failure, I, I think uh, most likely there may be an overlapping non-anatomical trait I, as I have, uh, I wanted to ask to you. So, but, uh, uh, so we must uh, practice to get the parameters which can indicate the presence of anatomical traits from our polysemnographic uh, uh, parameters for the time being. So we should practice to identify the Known anatomical traits from the polysemnographic parameter, and uh, because we don't have a research model, don't have in-lab uh, facilities to identify what is the peak rate value, what is this arousal threshold from CPAP uh, investigations, uh, uh, might be you have the facilities in your uh, advanced lab, but uh, we don't have these facilities to identify this anatomical trait, and we have to wait for the newer metrics to come. Uh, to identify this uh, anatomical trait. So identification of this non-anatomical traits, high low gain, low arousal threshold, and muscles recovery patterns. So these are, I think, many more important that, uh, than giving us one such fits all treatment with the CPAP, which we are practicing in this test. And there is my, most likely another palm classification, so, which includes all these things. 
and uh, uh, recently i have heard about the palm classification dividing the patient into palm class 1 2 3 before uh, prescribing a definitive treatment so uh, this sort of practice uh, uh, we should improve and uh, uh, with your guidance definitely you will highlight everything sir uh, today i am very much satisfied if i given a very thorough uh, discussion regarding this uh, newer uh, points what uh, we should uh, particularly try to assess before giving a advising a particular mode of treatment to any patients and uh, i will uh, i will uh, be interested if you in the next meetings or next visit or next workshop highlights uh, the ourselves that uh, not the ahi is the gold standard not the cpap is the gold standard we must evaluate each and every patient try without limited resources just like polysomnography how to catch this non anatomical trait so that we can give a more precise treatment more logical treatment to each of the patients doctor sarkar i will definitely like to add here you may say that cpap non gold standard but today cpap is the gold standard patient needs lot of counseling and polysomnography is the gold standard to measure the sleep to pick up so many things and that too not a split night if you are doing an overnight polysomnography the kind of sleep practice is being practiced in the country should be discouraged i will not elaborate that but at present 80% of the time if you do a good polysomnography study and you spend time with the patient for the cpap your problems are solved but this non anatomical traits yes they are the phenotypes of sleep as professor suri has elaborated so nicely uh, and it is impressive thank you very much i agree i agree for the today's session i think we are exceeding our time uh, dr suri has to attend another meeting and uh, i I, I am closing this session with the permission of Dr. Suri, and uh, 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 if permits, Dr. Suri can log in again after a couple of weeks so that you can highlight and summarize and give the practical tips for our group. That will be much better. So I request Dr. Suri to give a, a, a schedule so that with your busy schedule, I know about your schedules, but still I request on behalf of the allergy asthma chat. Uh, and uh, uh, give us a one hour session and uh, again may i come for a moment uh, okay sir can you come no. very shortly shortly no, no, no. I, i'm i'm not going to say i'm just going to congratulate uh, both of them chawla and suri and i would also request from your side that one day we would like to listen dr suri on a sleep on obstructive sleep apnea because you know he is a master person of this country as far as sleep is concerned so i would request him you also request him in one of our chats he may come and he may deliver a lecture on obstructive sleep apnea uh, dr suri i will add to the uh, request sorry. of dr rajen prasad and dr nagin prasad that in continuation if you can do give the time in two weeks after that will be much better sure, so right. my my privilege and pleasure sir you uh, whenever you will say i'll do that yes sir thank next you, next you, next coming meeting will be your meeting sir that <laughs> that will be announced and communicate to you shortly sir thank sure. you much sir thank you very much doctor thank you thank you, thank you for thank all you, thank you dr suri for a wonderful and enlightening lectures you have given